Chapter 28. The Invasion of Nabu, P.A.R.T. 4. Notes. Sorry for the delay, life somehow made it really tough to publish this chapter, I hope you like it. Many many thanks for your kind comments, I really enjoy reading you. I wish everyone a really nice weekend D. Chapter Text. Chapter 28. The Invasion of Nabu, P.A.R.T. 4. Anya looked at Kwai Gan's face and smiled a bit sadly. She had woken up to a sleepy Khan earlier that morning, who apparently had succeeded in connecting with Mo, at least ten times better than her, as she interpreted the absence of his usual aggressiveness in the force correctly. He had explained briefly that the Zabrak was in the shower, apparently, they had tinkered a bit on their respective ships earlier, and were both covered in engine grease, and on Khan's advice, he had reluctantly agreed a shower would in fact be needed, and went after grabbing a change of clothes on the scimitar. She had teased him slightly for dirtying himself that much, but he was quick to remind her about her own shortcomings and blood-stained face. He had taken her hand, at that point, his fingers warm against hers, his face solemn, distant, and he had told her he had been scared for her for a moment. The admission had probably cost him a lot, even though he was getting better at vocalizing his feelings, and she had nearly cried at his words, at the blunt truth she had heard behind them. He had hugged her, melting her heart into a puddle of warm fuzzy feelings, and she had hugged him back, finding that spot that seemed to fit her head perfectly. Being against him had felt good, right, natural, like something in her world had clicked and everything made sense, and it had taken all of her willpower to withdraw from the embrace. She had confessed with regrets that she had calmed Obi-Wan, and had told him she would visit Qui Gon, and that she needed to go now, as she wanted to have the time to do so before the stupid parade. When she had seen his crestfallen look she had compromised by offering him to share the refresher to have at least a few minutes to reconnect and discuss the events that had just transpired, and she was sure Maul had heard at least part of that when he came out, because she had never seen him look smugger. Khan had not appeared to care at all, and had just told the Sith he was going to clean up and sleep, and that he would be back later before starting to leave. Anya had followed after narrowing her eyes at Maul, who was exuding wicked amusement at her embarrassment, and would probably make good use of the knowledge they just provided him with. Once they had left him to his own devices in the medbay, what Mo thought and would make out of their relationship had fortunately faded to distant background noise, and the brief moment they had shared in the refresher had been a breath of fresh air after the heavy, stress-filled rotation she had just endured. Anya had afterward done a relatively simple outfit as it was always considered bad taste to try to outshine the Sovereign on their own planet, some military-inspired dress and an armor-weaved cloak, both a gorgeous deep dark red that would probably swear with whatever everyone else would be wearing. Pulled up her hair in a severe high ponytail, she circled in gold to match with her necklace and calm blessed it, to have a shuttle ready to go dirt side when she would arrive at the hangar. Khan had given her one last kiss, breathing courage in her veins when all she wanted to do was to lay in bed against him, and watch some holodramas, to avoid thinking about everything that had happened in the last two rotations, and she had left. She had never been to Nabu before, and the planet didn't make a strong impression on her. It was gorgeous, nice weather, beautiful buildings, flowers everywhere, but it also looked vulnerable and a bit fake, like it had all been built in the last centuries, which was true, she knew. Plasma Money had built that gigantic and strangely empty palace. It felt too new to be historical, a bit like those resort planets whose buildings mimicked other popular styles in the galaxy. Too shiny, too clean, too big for such a small planet on the galactic stage. Still, pretty enough, and the waterfalls were certainly a delightful show. Pinching her lips, she smoothed out her dress on her lap and sighed. Obi-Wan had met her as soon as she had landed, his face shifting oddly between the calm he had wanted to project and the obvious worry he had felt for his master. He had been slightly battered, but only a few bruises had still been visible on his forehead and right cheekbone, and his gait had looked normal. He had led her to a rather luxurious medbay in the palace where, in an individual room with an amazing view of the royal gardens, Qui-Gon had been, and still was, asleep on a medical bed, machines beeping around him. Anya had found a seat near the bed that had been there since, indifferent to the excited clamor that had started in the streets. She could feel that he was near conscious, just swaying the line between awake and asleep, but with the state of his leg, the doctors had just started lifting the sleeping medication, and his awareness would not return before his system had purged the drug. He would awaken in an hour, maybe a bit earlier. Judy reacted weirdly to medical treatments. Maul had spared his life, but after his escape on Tatooine, he hadn't wanted to let Qui-Gon go without a parting gift. Qui-Gon's leg was ruined. The muscle had been burnt all the way to the bone, damaging the femur and charring the flesh from the head to the knee. The surgeons had removed the dead tissue and back to dips and dressings, which ensured a faster healing process, but the scarring would be terrible, and the bone and muscles would never grow back as healthy and strong as before. Qui-Gon's preferred form, a terror, would probably never be accessible to him again. Maul would have done him a favor if he had cut off the leg entirely, easing the choice to implant a prosthetic. Now, Qui-Gon would have to choose between taking another path as a GD or trade his damaged natural leg for a prosthetic. She couldn't imagine it would be an easy decision. 
Anya was happy that he was alive, especially knowing how close he had been to meet his death the previous day, but it didn't stop her from feeling a dreadful amount of guilt for the GD master. She knew, she had known for years, and she had said nothing. And now Kwai Gon was there, unconscious on a hospital bed because her secrets were worth more than her friend's life. It wasn't that simple, she knew it, her brain knew it, but her heart ached still, compressed viciously by the shame she felt. In a way, she had betrayed him, ready to sacrifice his life and his health for her little plots and machinations. The thought tasted sour and made her nose scrunch in disgust. It wasn't very nice to be the betrayer, especially since she was well aware of how it felt to be betrayed. The door to the room opened, getting her out of her somber musings, and Queen Amidala stepped in, adorned in glistening white and cream, face painted less heavily than usual, a tinier metallic headpiece adorning her forehead like a very discreet crown. Anya would have sneered, but the cream was predominant enough, and they were on Nabu. If Nabus wore white for their celebrations, and they often did, well, she would roll with the punches despite her distaste for the color. Padawan Kenobi told me I would find you here, Senator Duku the Queen said, her voice firm yet soft. She didn't want to cause any discomfort to Qui-Gon, Anya could tell. It was a bit late for that though. Queen Amidala. Anya rose and they bowed lightly to each other, spines stiff, smiles more fake than real. She was curious about the Queen, she wanted to discover more about the woman that Khan had loved so much, and probably still loved. From what she had seen and heard Amidala seemed to be a promising leader. She had the potential to become a great politician, as she had in the past, and showed sentient qualities that were rare enough to notice. The queen was kind, brave, loyal, and she had an amazing moral compass, ready to sacrifice herself for her people if needed. If Khan had a type, being associated with Amidala was rather flattering. After discussing with her twice, once in her office and the second time via holocall after the battle, Anya decided that she liked her. Will you come to the parade? Amidala asked, breaking the silence that had started to stretch between them. Anya nodded. I will. It starts in an hour, doesn't it? Yes. She hummed in assent. Then I'll be there. Thank you, Senator Duku, for what you've done for Nabu the Queen told her, her voice stately, her back rigid. She was anticipating something. Did she think Anya would ask for some form of payment for her help? Anya gave her a crisp professional smile. You had the situation well in hand, Queen Amidala, I'm not afraid to admit that my support was limited. You saved countless Gungans' lives by disabling the droid ship so quickly, and you gave irrefutable proof to Chancellor Valorum of our claims in the Senate. You have my gratitude. Should you ever need something, Nabu will do his best to help the Queen offered. Thank you, your highness, but I did not help you to garner favor. You owe me no debt. If the time comes I will welcome Nabu's support, but I will not expect it on you replied smoothly. She did not need Nabu's debt, and would rather plant seeds of trust in his debt. Amidala smiled, a true one, that made her brown eyes shine amber in the late morning light, and didn't reply, recognizing the gift for what it was. She still looked young and a bit naive, far from the experienced politician she would perhaps become, but when she met her eyes, Anya saw what had captured Khan's heart. She was a beautiful person, inside and out. No wonder she had wanted to change things up so much in the Senate. She already had a taste of the politics cruelty, had seen how inefficient the Chancellor had been at helping her people, how apathetic the other senators were to her pleas. She was going to shake the wasp nest thoroughly in a few years. Anya would make sure she had solid foundations to do it and watch the show with the utmost delight. She raised her rating of the young queen, and saw an echo of the newfound respect she felt for her in the other's expression. The queen excused herself shortly afterward, telling Anya she would see her at the parade in an hour, and she went back to her quiet contemplation of Kwai Gon's progressive return to consciousness. His eyelids were fluttering softly now, his fingers twitching lightly against the bedsheets. She wondered briefly if she had done anything embarrassing while asleep earlier, since Maul apparently woke up way before her, but figured it probably went okay, since Khan didn't mention anything during the brief moment they had dedicated to catching up with each other in the refresher. Hui Gan groaned, and Anya called a nurse via the button near the bed. The palace didn't seem to employ a lot of droids, using human doctors and nurses instead. They were definitely better at bedside manners, but had the inconvenience of not being in the room all the time. Her uncle would have found it appalling. The thing he wasn't there. He was already aware of her little field trip to Nabu, he followed the news too closely to have missed it, but he hadn't reached out yet. Was he being tortured by Palpatine for her interference, or drinking himself to oblivion, convinced Qui-Gon was dead? In any case, the lack of angry calm call for blatant misuse of her birthday gift, was starting to worry her, especially considering how unstable he had been these last few months. She pinched her lips and pushed the thought away. She would have ample time to worry about him later, but right now Qui-Gon was her priority. The nurse arrived just as he regained consciousness, watching him let out a small gasp. She touched a few buttons to up his pain medications and check his vitals, then offered him a glass of water to sip slowly. The bearded man did as instructed, but Anya felt him reached into the force, meeting her signature briefly before seeking Obi-Wan's through their training bond. He wanted to know if his Padawan had survived. 
Obi-Wan is with Anakin and part of the council, I believe she told him reassuringly. Qui-Gon nodded as the nurse adjusted his bed into a sitting position and placed his pillows behind his back. He thanked her, voice still a bit rough from the medically induced sleep he had been under, and she left satisfied after asking him a couple of standard questions to check up on him, telling him a doctor would pass later, and asking Anya not to prolong her visit unnecessarily. What happened? He asked when they were finally alone. We managed to disable the emission towers of the droid control ship, then I believe little Anakin blew up the ship from the inside, and without any droids to fight down here, Naboo reclaimed the planet and arrested Viceroy Gunray and his acolytes. They were returned to Coruscant for trial this afternoon after the parade the Gungans and Naboos organized to celebrate their victory. He hummed noncommittally. And Obi-Wan. A couple of bruises on his face, but otherwise he looks in good shape. He looked relieved, his breathing easing back into a normal rhythm despite the pain he was obviously in, and extended a hand towards her. Unsure of his intentions at first, she placed hers on top after a few seconds of thinking, and he took her hand in his firm grip, his warmth seeping into her very bones, wonderfully bubbly with life. Her own breathing became easier, her heart swelling with affection for the older Jeevan. Qui-Gon was alive, and that was all that mattered at that moment. You warned me he asked with a grim expression. Ani tensed, then nodded stiffly, the warmth revealing slowly a less gentle intent. Qui-Gon could feel her pulse, could feel the force swirling in her veins, could sense her lies. She would have to trade carefully. I felt danger coming your way. I thought we both did, or I would have been more explicit. He frowned, meeting her eyes. What did you see? A fracture. A tension in the force, destined to break the current pattern one way or another, centered around you. Your string nodded, and I couldn't see if it would snap or continue. Huaigan didn't answer, his deep blue eyes lost in thoughts as he pondered over her words. It was true, all of it, but she phrased it cryptically enough to avoid annoying questions. She knew fairly well that force users had different ways of sensing the force, especially when trying to sense the future. He wasn't following the unifying force tenets like her, choosing the living force path like Khan. It anchored them in the present more firmly. Powering their instincts and giving them that impossible sort of sixth sense about any situations they found themselves in as long as they were willing to listen, but cut them from most impressions of the past and future Anya could get lost in for hours at a time. It didn't mean he didn't get her little story of force knitting, though. Qui-Gon had been a master for years now, his understanding of the mumbo-jumbo force users came up with to explain their metaphysical experiences was outstanding. He sighed, looking at his bandaged leg, and squeezed her hand a tiny bit harder. It seemed the knot is made, and my string will continue. She lowered her gaze, a new wave of joy coursing through her at the realization that he was alive, and with her, and okay, and she felt her eyes moisten under the strong emotion. I know it is not the GD way, but I am really happy that you didn't become one with the Force. He smiled, a beautiful, gentle smile that would have haunted her forever, if he had been killed because of her inaction, and put his second hand on their joint fingers. She sobbed a bit, the tears she had been holding, since she had bid him goodbye on the Senate landing pad, knowing full well it might be the last time she saw him alive, falling freely on her cheeks as sheer relief overcame her, easing the weight that had crushed her ribcage for months now. I suppose it was not his will he whispered. She laughed softly, wiping her tears with her free hand, but when she looked up it was like a shadow had passed on his face. Whatever he was remembering, it was not something pleasant. Anya safely hypothesized that it was about the fight and the will of the Force. He had seen Maul hesitate, hadn't he? He had felt the moment he was supposed to go down, and knew the other had felt it too. He was remembering that he had not only been saved by the will of the Force, but by the grace of his opponent. A Sith, sparing a Jedi. Food for thoughts for the whole council once he would make his report, for sure. Seeing he wasn't keen on speaking anymore, she rose quietly and asked him if he needed anything. He asked for another glass of water she provided quickly, hands trembling slightly when the memory of doing the exact same for Maul hours earlier flashed in her mind. She stepped back, looking at him, and excused herself. As she stayed any longer, she risked a bit of a diplomatic incident, and she was still tired enough to make a mistake she would regret dearly afterward. Qui-Gon told her to go, thanked her for being there, and was sipping his water, eyes deep in thoughts, when she turned and left. The walk through the palace was boring as hell, the place too large and too empty for her taste, its large stony corridors marked by blaster fire, the wreckage created by the fights slowly cleaned by droids and humans alike. After quickly checking her face still looked presentable enough after her little crying fit, she joined the delegation of GD and dignitaries, unpleasantly including Palpatine, in the courtyard Valorum's ship had landed on. Benray was being escorted by Senate guards when she arrived, whining that this was all a misunderstanding, and Panaka mocked him with a witty remark she didn't quite catch. She quickly attracted Obi-Wan's attention through the Force, pulling at his signature like one would pull at a sleeve, while keeping her face perfectly neutral and amicable, as she was discreetly greeted by the delegation, no one really wanting to ruin Naboo's glorious moment of chasing the Trade Federation away with the benediction of the Senate. 
He came soon enough, little Anakin following him with a beaming smile when he recognized her. The child was all dressed up, looking every bit the tiny Padawan he was a would-be, missing only the dreadful hairstyle, and she couldn't help but smile back. What is it? Obi-Wan was whispering, somewhat annoyed at her maneuver. She decided to answer in a low tone too after greeting them both with as much warmth she could exhibit in a semi-public context. Qui-Gon is awake. He jolted, reaching out through the force, and his face looked suddenly a lot more relieved and a lot less tense than it did before. How is he? She nearly shrugged and caught herself. The Countess did not shrug, especially not in front of the Chancellor, it would have been most unbecoming. She settled for an unconvinced pout. His leg hurt, and he was quite worried about you, but outside of that he appeared to be fine. Obi-Wan looked torn, and she could understand. He knew the parade would start any minute now, and he was required to attend as a guest of honor, but he also wanted to run to his master and check for himself if Qui-Gon was alright, and he wanted to do it now. Feeling rather compassionate, she eased his dilemma. The nurse gave him more antalgics. You might want to let him rest for now, Padawan Kenobi. He nodded in her direction and turned back to the Naboo delegation. Palace officials were forming groups to position behind the queen during the parade, and they got separated soon enough. Obi-Wan and Anakin went with the GD on the queen's right, but would be front row, whereas Anya was grouped with the senate officials, joining Chancellor Valorum and Senator Palpatine on the queen's left. Valorum greeted her warmly, happy to see a friendly face among the vaguely hostile Naboos that hadn't taken the senates in action during the whole conflict very well, and Palpatine smiled coldly while taking in her blood-red outfit, contrasting as expected with his and Valorum dark blue robes. Both politicians were carefully avoiding each other. It would have been invisible on anyone not savvy enough in the Senate's intricate maze of alliances and feuds, but the once great friendship they shared seemed colder now. She guessed Thalarm, a brilliant mind despite his lack of spine, was perfectly aware that his once friend had been the one to whisper the idea of the vote of no confidence to Amidala's young ears. Compiled with a suspicious eerie added disaster and the general distrust Thalarm felt for most of his inner cycle, Palpatine's fall from his grace was predictable. She hoped he was pissed. They both tried to speak to her, Valorum to congratulate her for her military success, Palpatine to thank her for helping his people, but before they could engage in what would have been an awful conversation, the palace guards stood at attention, signaling to everyone that Amidala was about to speak. The queen gave a sweet, somewhat insipid speech announcing the Gungan's arrival, her brilliant mind probably exhausted from the chain of events that led them all here, and Anya forced herself not to flinch, as the loud trumpets and drums of the humanoids resonated in deep streets. The Gungan leader and two other of his kind, dismounted the creatures they had adorned in feathers and fine draperies, then joined the queen on top of the palace's stairs. The queen took a plasma orb from an old man that probably held some sort of official function on Naboo, and gave it to the Gungan leader, who raised it over his head. Peace. Not very creative, but then again the entire thing was there to boost the population's morale, and it was definitely a statement. Cheers erupted in the crowds while everyone in the delegation clapped politely, Palpatine's fake enthusiasm triggering a wave of nausea in her throat. She saw from the corner of her eyes Anakin and Amidala, trading a smile, and felt her heart melt at the interaction, then listened distractedly, as the Queen announced festivities would be held in deep during the rest of the afternoon, celebrating the end of the invasion. Anya waited until the crowd thinned out, then excused herself, not particularly keen on enjoying a party involving Senator Palpatine, his presence was grating on her nerves a bit more with every passing second, then bid everyone goodbye before walking back to her shuttle, where one of her pilots was waiting. The return to her ship was uneventful. She stopped by the bridge first, instructing a relatively hangover Lester to plan and proceed with their return on Coruscant, then went down to her private quarters, and found Khan asleep in the master bedroom, clutching his lightsaber pearl. Will felt like he was asleep too in one of the guest rooms, probably relocated from the uncomfortable medbay bed by her thoughtful boyfriend at some point during the five hours she had spent on Naboo. Smiling at the idea of what looked like the beginning of a friendship she wouldn't have placed any bet on initially, she removed her makeup and outfit before joining Khan. He passed an arm around her when she slid under the covers, not fully awake but somewhat aware of her presence, and she was home again. Concerning, you report is. Kui Gan Jin closed his eyes for a second, inhaling slowly, sinking in the comforting embrace of the force, and released his breath in a small sigh, directing the energy towards his aching leg to ease the pain away. The parade was over for a few hours now, the sun setting slowly on Naboo, and he had just finished retelling his version of the events that transpired the previous day to Yoda, Mace Windu, and Obi-Wan. His soon-to-be ex-Padawan was rubbing his chin, sat on the chair that had welcomed Anya earlier that day, no doubt reliving his own duel with what they identified now as a Sith Lord Viceroy Gunray had called Darth Maul. Yoda and Mace were on two other chairs the gentle nurse attending him had brought earlier, when she realized he had visitors, and though Mace was notoriously hard to read, he could tell he was worried. What was he concerned about, that Qui-Gon didn't know? After a rather long silence, Obi-Wan raised his head, his expression grim. He spared me, too. Mace's frown deepened. 
Padawan Kenobi. Forgive me, masters, I dismissed it as arrogance in my first report, but after hearing my master's report, I now see this was calculated. The Sith had the means to kill me, to kill us both, and chose not to. He had me at his mercy, and he did nothing but play. Obi-Wan sounded a tad disappointed, but Qui-Gon didn't have the heart to admonish him for his lack of gratitude. He was disturbed by the strange behavior exhibited by the Dark Sider, had been since he had remembered, a few minutes after his return to consciousness. How they both had known the exact moment Qui-Gon had lost, and how after a second of hesitance the Sith had chosen his leg instead of his torso to strike at. He had first been convinced that Obi-Wan was dead when he woke up, sorrow rising in his chest as the burn of failure settled in his heart, then he had felt him in the force, bright and brilliant as ever, and he had thought dog. He had thought Obi-Wan won, and he had been very proud of his student, if a bit worried about what he had to resort to in order to survive. Turned out, the Sith had just fallen down the well avoiding Obi-Wan's strike, a strike that just grazed him, and hadn't tried to recover from the fall. Obi-Wan felt him die in the force minutes afterward, right before a tornado of black potent energy infused with rage and grief, had exploded over the palace, the power so dark his Padawan had fainted over the assault on his senses. The body hadn't been found, and Obi-Wan had sighted an unknown ship taking off next to the palace, shortly before Maul died. Someone had retrieved the fallen Sith, someone had been devastated when he had passed away. The ship had disappeared shortly after the outburst, cloaked by some device, and was probably light years away now. Who was piloting? Darth Maul's master. And did Maul commit suicide? Why? What was his goal, if he hadn't killed any of them? Revealing the Sith to the GD. It made no sense, Sith had nothing to gain by revealing themselves when apparently they had managed to stay hidden for a thousand years floating in the darkness. According to everything we know about Sith, mercy is not their way Mace replied, eyes narrowed slightly. Yoda hummed, seemingly lost in thoughts. Always two, they are, no more, no less. The apprentice, this one was. Imperfect, his training may have been. And wasn't that worrying too. Darth Maul had been a fierce fighter, a duelist like Qui-Gon had seldom encountered. Mace Windu could have given him a run for his credits, Yoda too, and Dooku could probably still best this type of foes in combat, but few others in the Order could have stayed alive against the Sith. Maul had wiped the floor with him, his deceitful aggressiveness hiding clever tactical skills and a well-conceived battle plan. For all of his fury, he had never let go of his goals, acting just as much as he was fighting, pretending to lose ground to guide them where he wanted them to be, letting Obi-Wan assume he hadn't noticed his maneuvers and his arrogance, pretending to fall after receiving only a minor injury. Could he also have faked his death, to then be really killed? What about the grief? What about the rage? Why would his master be so upset if he had killed Maul himself? Nothing made sense. Qui-Gon thought back to the yellow eyes he had caught watching them outside of Dooku's residence, escaping them without any issue, of the dark presence he had felt on Coruscant a couple of times, of the shadowed figure wreaking havoc on the underworld. Maul, all of them, and where the apprentice was, the master was never far. A Sith master had been on Coruscant, right under their very eyes, and they hadn't even felt him once. I felt him on Coruscant. Obi-Wan and I saw him, once, watching us. He fled and we gave chase, but couldn't get him. I thought I recognized the speeder on Tatooine Qui-Gon told them, giving a rather pointed look to Master Yoda. He had pushed, again and again, and he had been denied every single time. The idea that Maul himself had been the only thing preventing his and Obi-Wan's death, left a sour taste in his mouth that had nothing to do with Bacta. They threw him a sharp glance. Then the Master must also reside or at least do frequent trips there too. He wouldn't leave such a young apprentice unattended for long. But he started before a thought crossed his mind. A dangerous one, a compassionate one. They wouldn't understand, they hadn't fought the Sith, they hadn't witnessed that instant, but Qui-Gon did, and he trusted his instincts above all else. Maul had wanted to kill and held back, Maul had tried to make it seem like he had died in that well. What if he had wanted to get out of the Sith's grasp? What if he left them alive to avoid retaliation once he got his freedom? But then he had died, anyway, his plan foiled either by the injuries he had sustained, or by the very being that had enslaved him in the first place. It made his stomach pinch and unease, especially after Tatooine. Yoda gave him one of his stares, reading his very soul, and his ears twitched in what he interpreted as a frown. A hypothesis, you have. The criminal I have been tracking on Coruscant held no mercy for his targets, and kept himself well concealed. Our fight was staged cleverly, speaking of strategy, of skills. Mace raised a brow. Continue. Darth Maul had a plan, he wanted something specific out of this fight. Something important enough to pass on the opportunity of killing two GD he said, realizing how distant, how far-fetched his words sounded as he uttered them. As it seemed disturbingly common these days, Anya's words, uttered in that fancy botanical garden he had met her at months ago, rang in his head. Who would benefit from Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon staying alive? Maul. Who would benefit from Maul being truly dead? His master. Someone that wanted the GD to know the Sith were not a long-forgotten cult but a reality. Someone that wanted to scare them into making mistakes. 
someone that wanted a new apprentice and didn't care for a disobedient one. He gritted his teeth, thinking about his old master, about Cypher Dia's death, about the hesitation he had caught in the Sith's eyes. Hui Gan was supposed to die, breaking another one of Dooku's attachments to the light. Obi-Wan was the one that needed to stay alive to report on the Sith's unexpected survival. Maul had betrayed his master by leaving him alive. Could his master have killed him in turn, stabbing him in the back after his fake death in answer to Maul's treason? The thought twisted something in his gut and doused his insides in icy water, Zanato's memory, smiling as he leaped to his death in an acid pool to escape him churning uneasily in the back of his mind. His presence must have shifted too, for all GD in the room looked at him with worried eyes. He was supposed to kill me and let Obi-Wan live, he refused. His master killed him. Yoda let out a small huff. Speculation, this is. Qui-Gon kept quiet, unwilling to let them know about Dooku at that point. If the Sith Master went to such length to isolate him, to methodically break every bond he held dear, maybe there was still something to salvage here, and he knew in his heart he had to try. Yoda sighed at his stubbornness, but let him be. Qui-Gon was not known as the Maverick of the GD Order for nothing, and if his Grand Master often chastised him, he respected the fact that they had different views, and knew when a battle of wills was lost in advance. Careful of their clashing opinions, Mace chose to change topics, even though the one he picked was only marginally lighter. The Council has decided to accept Anakin Skywalker in the Order, and to knight Padawan Kenobi, for the qualities he demonstrated on this mission. However, we were waiting for you to regain consciousness before deciding who will supervise his training. Qui-Gon felt his heart clench painfully, caught between a rock and a hard place. He wanted to train Anakin Skywalker. The boy was the chosen one, and a beautiful, kind, and compassionate soul entrusted to him by his mother, under the implicit promise he would help her son accomplish his destiny. Qui-Gon couldn't wait to see how he would flourish, and had always envisioned himself as the one who would train him. But if he spent his days chasing after Dooku and investigating the Sith, as the Force wished him to, pushed him to, then dragging along such a young Padawan would be dangerous. And his leg would not anyway allow him to teach anything the boy would be even remotely interested in at the moment. If he wanted the best there was for the boy, he had to let him go. When Qui-Gon looked at Obi-Wan, his Padawan turned knight was playing with his sleeve in agitation. He knew something was up. He sighed and answered Mace. I do not plan on replacing my leg. Mace inclined his head, his expression politely surprised, his skepticism clear in the force. Tonight Kenobi, you wish us to entrust Padawan Skywalker. I believe it was the will of the force. I believe it still is Qui-Gon replied, thankful to feel his words ring true. Yoda's ears twitched in what could have been annoyance. Disapprove, I do. I want to be involved in Anakin's training, but I can't be his master. I am being called once again, Grand Master, and I won't bring a young Padawan on my quest. Obi-Wan looked at him with narrowed eyes, both unsurprised and annoyed at being thrown under the speeder, and stopped playing with his sleeve. There was a quiet sort of resolution about him, when that spoke of past betrayals and new beginnings. Qui-Gon frowned lightly. He would need to address what had happened with the council before they had left Coruscant, to assuage the old pain he had brought back from the grave, with his hasty words and carelessness. Obi-Wan clenched his jaw, his resolution given purpose, and spoke. If the council agrees, I will take on Anakin Skywalker as my Padawan, with Master Jin's occasional support, I will supervise his training. Yoda's ear twitched again, Mace however didn't move, unfazed by Obi-Wan's suggestion, and the little green master nodded once, humming in approval. Submit your proposal to the council, I will. Both council members excused themselves shortly afterward, wishing him a good rest and a prompt recovery, but Obi-Wan remained. His jaw was still clenched, and his eyes finally showed the emotions he had been repressing in front of Mace and Yoda. Obi-Wan was tired, Obi-Wan was angry, Obi-Wan was happy, but Obi-Wan felt lost. Qui-Gon put his hand on the young knight's shoulder, stopping his spiraling feelings from swallowing him whole. It is a call, Obi-Wan he stated, his eyes meeting lost blue ones. His Padawan sighed. I can feel it too, I just thought I just don't know if I'm ready for this. Qui-Gon smiled, sweet and sour memories crossing his mind as he remembered his own journey as a master. Lord, no one can be. You'll do the best you can, you'll strive to do better, to improve. You'll fail at times, succeed too. Teaching is a journey, both for the master and the Padawan. Obi-Wan stayed silent a moment, his inner peace slowly rebuilding itself as he integrated the words of his master. He put his hand on his, both calloused, the touch familiar from years of companionship and support. What are you going to do now? I'm going to heal, then I'll follow the force, wherever it guides me he answered vaguely. Obi-Wan squeaked, offended. Master. Qui-Gon sighed again, his favorite excuse laying beheaded at the feet of Obi-Wan's righteous indignation. He had heard it too much to believe it fully, and he knew he owed him more. I was once a Padawan. Maybe it is time for me to revisit that journey. What is wrong with Master Dooku? Obi-Wan asked, his experienced intuition piercing the layers of vagueness Qui-Gon used to wrap his true intents. That's what I'm going to try and found out. He caught the other's gaze and pressed his hand. I apologize, Obi-Wan. 
I realize now my words before the council were rash and dismissive. I should have discussed it with you beforehand. I am proud to be your master. I truly think you are ready to be knighted, and I was neither trying to push you away, nor to replace you with another Padawan. I think I feel it now, how this was meant to be. Thank you, master, for trusting me with Anakin's training. I will not fail him. Between them, the specter of what could have been hanged heavy, dragging its claws on their hearts as careful happiness pulsated through their bond. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan were alive, and even if it left them with more questions than answers, the fact remained. He felt himself starting to drift in and out of consciousness as their comfortable silence stretched, and Obi-Wan sensed it too. He rose slowly from his chair, his face contrite, and bid him a quick goodbye before starting to leave. Qui-Gon interrupted his maneuver, his voice sounding tired to his own ears. Obi-Wan. Yes master. He replied gently. Thank you. His nearly knighted Padawan smiled, gratitude and tenderness, permeating the air like the sweetest perfume, nodded, and left. Mole was confused. He looked at the coarse scanty skyline, the view from his apartment obstructed by various tall buildings, expensive ones, and took another sip of whiskey, his eyes finding without even searching for it the princess's penthouse. The alcohol was not the best the planet had to offer, by far, but it was familiar, comforting, and it took his mind off from the fresh, clean-cut bond he could feel each time he found the Force, laying slain in his brain like a defeated foe. Mol wasn't sure what was real and what it, his mind still unused to the freedom, making everything taste like a hallucination, but also feeling the most lucidity had been in decades. He had gone through the motions in automated mode once Anya's cruiser started orbiting Coruscant. Took off, cloaked, bypassed the controls, landed in a private hangar Sidious had no knowledge of, grabbed his stuff from his ship, went home to the flat he had privately started to use a few months back, and got himself drunk on cheap whiskey. Mole was free. Mole was free and the thought didn't comfort him the way he thought it would. Mole was free and afraid, and if freedom was not what he expected, he was starting to fear revenge wouldn't be either, and the thought was paralyzing. What was he going to do, now, if he didn't get his revenge? What was he going to do after he did? What did Mole want? Who was Mole, if not Sidious' slave? Who was he? He took another swig, pensive and anxious. His stunt on Naboo had brought him more questions than answers, but he wasn't completely unhappy about the situation, not when he was free. His mind glossed over his recent memories once again, something warm and unfamiliar pulsating in his gut when he thought back to the bitch and her dog. He wasn't sure what to make of the odd couple, though he liked both of them better when they were near each other, for sure. Maybe that was the true nature of that unfamiliar feeling, maybe he liked them. Mole grimaced and felt the alcohol return in his throat as his stomach lurched. There was no way he would ever lower himself to thinking about that again. Mole was power. Mole was fear. Mole was a hunter. He did not need to like anything, especially not stupid humans showing erratic behaviors. Still, Anya had taken the pain away from him, had provided him with means to escape and resources, she had said she wanted an ally. He was starting to believe her, was starting to tolerate her infuriating manners and disgustingly expensive scent, and he knew it was dangerous. She was a politician, a trained liar, but in the force, her kindness rang true, and it enraged him not to know whether or not she was being shattered by carefully distorting the truth or just being plain honest. She had taken a risk, for him. She had bled, for him. In Mole's eyes, it meant something, it had to, and it made hating her that much harder. Khan was just as complicated to assess, for completely different reasons. The Sith, the warrior that leaked that terrifying power, cast a significant shadow over the passionate young engineer with a corporate job, that got so excited over Scimitar's cloaking system. His eyes didn't even stay yellow, they had turned grayish blue when he had woken up, and had been fully blue when he had seen him for the last time, right before boarding Scimitar. His old master had done it with alchemy, hiding his true nature, but it didn't seem to be any type of cover. Convener could go fully dark, then come back to the light, and stay in control of himself in the process. The man was either a criffing master at hiding his powers or a complete psycho. He was devilishly good at seeming completely innocent right before and right after exploding in an inferno of darkness that could burn the very air around them. In a way, that made him worse than his previous master. Unpredictable, dangerous, and likely unstable. The rest of him, the man, not the Sith, discreet but agreeable, extremely clever, not very talkative but chatty enough when he discussed ships, not to mention completely smitten with Anya, did not seem fake at all, though. Khan genuinely cared about her, about his job, about Mol even, and it made him a lot better than his master, a lot more alive, and a lot more confusing too. When they were in the same room, the very air seemed to be warmer, the force dancing on his skin like lazy rays of sun on a nice afternoon, making his eyes soften and his heart slow down. He hated it, he liked it, and somewhat everything in between. His eyes fell on the penthouse again, and he clenched his teeth. He had never considered before that a Force-sensitive could be in a relationship. Sidious had beaten into him that bonds were only good if they were broken, relationships were to serve goals, not fulfill any kind of higher aspiration. 
True attachments were dangerous, unwise, and stupid according to his master, and Maul hadn't had any reason to believe he could be wrong. He had unwillingly torn the bond tying him to his mother when he was young following his master's instructions, hadn't had any significant one on Mustafer, and had steered clear from temptations once he had started going on missions. Maul had no friends, Maul had no lovers, Maul had no one, but Maul. And now Maul had allies he wasn't sure he wanted, allies that questioned everything he thought he knew about the force, about life, about people. Allies that shared a bond so stupidly strong he had been genuinely taken aback once it flared to life in the medbay, so strong in fact he had been reminded of his lessons on the rule of two, of Darth Bane's dumb goal. The seductive beginnings of a manufactured diet, one created not by a forceful master-apprentice bond like the Sith foresaw, but by a willing possibly involuntary enmeshing of their very essences as their relationship grew. Mull had probed, sniffed, tasted it, and he was quite sure they weren't even aware of how weirdly their cringe romantic link behaved when they were both using the force at the same time. Sidious would be appalled if he had felt what Mull felt, the intricate link blossoming like flowers in spring, spreading a kind of energy he had never sensed from a Jedi nor a Sith, something that felt alive in the purest form of the term, away from dogma and rules and codes. Something visceral, that made him want to feast, to laugh, to dance, and sing. Something that made life tempting again. It had been the most uncomfortable thing he had experienced in years. It had felt like love. His own severed bond twitched, amputated, frayed at the edge, trying to connect with the closest relationship he had ever known in his life. The one he had with his master. It stayed lifeless, silent, the tie broken, and he couldn't yet tell if he was relieved or saddened. He took a long sip out of the bottle, a distant howl of pain echoing in his mind as the phantom bond pulsated. Who was Mole? What did Mole want? Revenge, revenge, revenge. Anya was annoying Sidious in the political ring, Khan was annoying him on the Sith playfield, even though he had not described his exact plans to Mole. Mole needed to find a way to impede his plots, to decrease his power. Mole needed to become so frustrating Sidious would never regret anything more than his behavior with him, scarifying him like a ritual offering to the GD, providing on a platter an easily defeated foe to the first fight of a coming war. Mole had a plan. Mole was going to take control of the galactic underworld. Mole would get revenge. Luckily, he knew exactly where to start, had been at it for months, behind Sidious's back, preparing their fallout, planning a way out should Sidious cast him out. He finished his bottle of cheap whiskey with a frown, his wish to drink himself stupid forgotten, and grabbed his datapad to write some messages to his contacts. Maul had work to do, 